Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to News Dose. Today, MLB The Show 21 releases, which means for the first time ever, the franchise debuts on an Xbox device, and better yet, you can download it through Xbox Game Pass. This is a monumental moment in gaming history as a PlayStation developed game releases for Xbox, but that's not the only Xbox Game Pass game releasing. Microsoft revealed the lineup for the second half of April, and there's some pretty interesting games here that I think you might want to check out. I know I certainly will. Also, is PlayStation taking these Metacritic scores a little too serious? Now, I do understand that Metacritic scores can be a useful tool to find new games, but it seems like PlayStation's decision may revolve around Metacritic more than what you would think. So we're going to talk about that as well, plus plenty more. As usual, we have a lot of things to talk about as I keep you up to date with what's happening in the game industry. To start things off today though, we get to talk about E3. It's almost hard to believe, but in just a little under two months, E3 will be upon us once again. No more Summer Game Fest, or as some of you like to call it, Summer Game Mess. Yeah, I know a lot of you are really excited for this year's E3. I am as well, but there are some notable absentees at this E3. The publishers that have confirmed their participation is Xbox, Nintendo, Capcom, Konami, interestingly enough, very curious what they have planned, also Ubisoft, Take-Two, Warner Brothers, and Koch Media. So there are some big names here, and we can now add Square Enix to that list, or at least to some capacity. Now, they haven't confirmed their own event or anything like that, or at least yet, but what they did say is that they will have an, an announcement at E3. What this could possibly mean is that a new Square Enix game is set to be revealed at the Xbox or Nintendo conference, assuming Square Enix doesn't have their own event. There have been some rumors that Square Enix will announce more Xbox Game Pass games, so that's something to keep in mind. For that matter, we're still waiting for more information on Final Fantasy VII Remake for other platforms. That was a timed PlayStation exclusive, and that ended earlier this month. They are legally allowed to talk about other platforms now, unless maybe PlayStation extended their timed exclusivity deal. That is possible, but we'll see what happens with all that. Also, Square Enix is one of the better publishers for the Nintendo Switch. It really wouldn't surprise me if they announced a new game for the Switch, but yeah, E3 just continues to sound better and better. Next up, let's talk about Konami just for a moment. We don't really get to talk about them too much anymore, but here recently they have been showing some signs of life. There are some major rumors floating around that some of their old IP are indeed coming back, and as I just mentioned, they will apparently be at E3. I'm still very curious what that's about. Well, now some new Konami trademarks were recently spotted, and check this out. They've reportedly renewed trademarks for both Metal Gear Rising and Castlevania. Okay, that's interesting, especially right before E3. Maybe we could get a remaster of Metal Gear Rising. This was a hack and slash type spinoff where you play as Raiden. It's not really my favorite game in the world, but it was a fun spinoff made by Platinum Games. Obviously, they're a fantastic studio working on Nier Automata, Astral Chains, Bayonetta, and here with Metal Gear Rising. They really are experts when it comes to these hack and slash type of games, and they do age well. However, when it comes to these trademarks, you always need to keep in mind that companies renew trademarks all the time, and it's not necessarily because they're making a new game. I mean, I want a new Castlevania as much as anybody else, but at the same time, there's other plausible reasons for trademarks like this. Metal Gear Rising is still on active devices today. It's available on Steam and the Xbox Store, so they could be renewing it for that reason. Now, as for Castlevania, they have the ongoing Netflix anime, and they just released Symphony of the Night on mobile devices last year. What I will say though, if a new game does pop up, I would bank on a new Castlevania game. With the Netflix show doing so well, I'm sure there is some interest in a new game, or at least I hope so. If anything, these trademarks pique my interest just that much more for what they have planned at E3. The Metal Gear Solid rumors are pretty strong right now, but I guess we'll see soon enough. Now, yesterday we talked about PlayStation reversing their decision to shut down the PlayStation Vita and PlayStation 3 store. Once again, kudos to Jim Ryan and PlayStation for admitting their mistake and more importantly, fixing it. However, the PSP was still an unfortunate casualty as the PSP store will go away on July 2nd. This is not ideal obviously, but this will be much less felt than the Vita and PS3 store going away. 
A part of the reason is that when PSP was really popular, digital wasn't nearly as big at the time, so not as many games were digital only. They did eventually release PSP Go in, I believe, I want to say 2009, which was a digital only console, but it didn't really do all that well on the market. Either way, the PSP store will officially shut down on July 2nd, and thanks to the Video Game Chronicles, we know exactly how many games will disappear forever. 35 games are set to vanish with this store closure, including Loco Roco Midnight Carnival, Ape Quest, several Hot Shots games, plus more. Previously, with the Vita store and PS3 store closing down, that would have been 140 games disappearing, so this still is a big improvement. Again, it's not exactly ideal, but if you do want to download any of these games before that store closure, you might want to start picking them up now. Moving on, we got some new Xbox Game Pass games to talk about, and I always get excited about this every month. I love me some Xbox Game Pass where I get to try new games that I might have otherwise missed, and the second half of April is one of those lineups. So let's check it out. As mentioned before, MLB The Show 21 released today, then you have Fable Anniversary and Fable 3, Second Extinction, Destroy All Humans, and Fogs. Now, I don't know about Fogs per se, it looks a little strange, but I don't know, it's got an odd kind of charm to it. You can at least check this one out, and who knows, it might be fun. All of these other games though are definitely worth looking into. Second Extinction is an upcoming cooperative Xbox console exclusive. It kind of reminds me of Left 4 Dead, but with dinosaurs which are way cooler than zombies anyways. Now, I don't expect this game to get amazing reviews or anything like that, but it does look like a pretty looking game, and I think it will be a lot of fun, especially if you have some friends to play with. I think just from a graphical standpoint alone, it looks fantastic. I think this game is going to look amazing on the Xbox Series X. Either way though, I can see this one having a lot of success in Xbox Game Pass. This is for sure one of those games that I will try out and see if I like it myself, and that's exactly what you want to see happen with a subscription like this. Get your game in the hands of the players, and that's a part of the brilliance of launching your game into Xbox Game Pass. Getting that day one release could automatically get the ball rolling for that word of mouth, and you just get so much more attention by launching into Xbox Game Pass day one. We saw what happened earlier this month with Outriders and how that game was a massive success, and a big part of that was because it launched into Xbox Game Pass day one. And then of course Fable Anniversary and 3 are really good games as well. These are a little older now, but if you want to get caught up on the Fable franchise before the rebooted version releases, you can now play the entire trilogy via Xbox Game Pass. Yes, Fable 2 is on there as well. And don't forget about Destroy All Humans. This franchise has a bit of a cult following, and for a good reason. It's a fun game that never really takes itself too serious. I mean, the title kind of explains everything. You play in the late 1950s as an alien, and well, you destroy all humans and the occasional cow. It's an amusing game and a lot of fun at the same time. It is a remake of a game that came out in 2005, but the gameplay has aged well and visually, it's a good looking remake. I'm really happy to see this one come to Xbox Game Pass, and now maybe more people can play this game and see why so many people do enjoy it so much. But yeah, this is an overall solid lineup for Xbox Game Pass, especially with MLB The Show making its debut on Xbox. Now, I'm not going to say this is the best lineup ever, but there are several games here worth checking out, and that's a part of the beauty of Xbox Game Pass. Let me know in the comments though on which game you're looking forward to the most. Are you excited to try out Second Extinction? What about MLB The Show coming to Xbox for the first time, and also Destroy All Humans? Let me know in the comments below on what game you're excited for. Let's talk about PlayStation though. Metacritic has become a big talking point as of recent. Reportedly, the reason the sequel to Days Gone was rejected was not because the original had no success. On the contrary, Days Gone was successful with it selling millions and millions of copies, but reportedly, Sony rejected the sequel because the original did not review well. Well, this was basically confirmed by the Days Gone creative director John Garvin. In an interview with David Jaffe, he had this to say, This is just the reality of Sony. Metacritic's score is everything. If you're the creative director on a franchise and your game is coming out to a 70, you're not going to be the creative director on that franchise for very long. So there it is, it was true after all. Even if your game has success, if it doesn't review well, you're unlikely to get a second chance with PlayStation. And before I really dive into this topic, I think this is a shame and I'll explain why. 
Days Gone obviously sits at a 71 overall score on Metacritic, which if we just look at the number, it's an average game. However, I think it's important to note that fans do seem to disagree with critics here. User scores were pretty good for Days Gone, with an 83 overall score, and I've always noticed a lot of people really did like this game. There's even a new petition out to get a sequel, which is getting a lot of traction online. Last time I heard it had 50,000 signatures, which is absolutely crazy. So fans do seem to like this game, and that right there is the divide. The problem with Days Gone wasn't necessarily because it was just a bad game. I mean, sure, not everybody liked it, but it had some issues at launch that needed to be fixed. It had performance problems as well as technical issues, and that was something that several reviewers noted. What I think some people need to understand about Metacritic scores, though, is more often than not, these scores reflect a game's launch. Take a look at something like Sea of Thieves and Rainbow Six Siege as an example. Sea of Thieves launched as a bare-bones game and forever will remain as a 69 overall score on Metacritic. Interestingly enough though, it turned out to be an amazing game in the long run, with Rare adding more and more content over time, and their success reflects on that game's overall improvement. It's now reached 20 million plus players, and the community loves it. Rainbow Six Siege has a similar story, with it having a 73 overall score on Metacritic. And let me tell you, Siege is one of the best competitive multiplayer games ever made, hands down, especially as it got more content and when they fixed up its server issues. So what I'm trying to say is games evolve over time, but scores do not evolve with them. Days Gone isn't necessarily a multiplayer game, but it was a game kind of like that and how it improved over time. They did fix some of its launch issues with patches, and now it's just a better overall game, especially if you play it on the PS5. Now we can sit here and say they shouldn't have released it with technical issues, and well, that's a valid point, but at the same time, it's still a game with obvious potential and I think that's why so many fans like it now. It did ultimately turn out to be the game many hoped it would be, it just kind of took a while to get there. But according to PlayStation, it's done too late. They've already rejected the Days Gone sequel and it seems like they may not be considering the fans' opinion on this matter. It just seems like the whole reason not to have a sequel for this game is solely based on Metacritic without looking into any other metric. I hope that's not the case because surely there has to be another reason not to go forward with a project like this. I have heard stories about this game having some troubled development in the past and maybe that played a part into it. But I mean we just talked about this yesterday, but thankfully Square Enix decided to go forward with Nier Automata after the first Nier performed poorly. Look at it now though, Nier Automata was a big success and now they're working on a remaster of the original game, they sell Nier merchandise, and there's even a new mobile game. So thankfully they didn't give up on Nier. I don't know, I guess it is what it is, but at least Sony Band is working on a new IP and that's exciting on its own. I'll be interested to see what that game is, and I do trust Sony Ben to make another good game. You know, Uncharted Golden Abyss was a good game as I keep mentioning on this channel, and so was Siphon Filter. So I think that they do have a bright future. Sure, this new IP wasn't their first choice as their planned sequel was rejected by Sony, and I know a lot of fans want a sequel, but at the end of the day, I am excited to see what they bring out next. In many ways, I would actually prefer a new IP, but there are a lot of people out there that do want a sequel, and again, I know it was Sony Ben's first choice. And onto the poll of the day, we continue to hear a lot about xCloud. They just expanded xCloud to iOS devices, and the beta is rolling out now. That's cool and everything, but what if Xbox decided to release their own dedicated Xbox handheld? Would you buy something like that? And 60% of you said yes. I hope you're listening Xbox because there is a portion of your fan base willing to buy into an Xbox handheld. Let's make this happen. As several of you pointed out in the comments though, there is a good chance that if Xbox did do something like this, xCloud could end up being the primary reason. They might not necessarily do offline games, but instead make a 5G device to play Xbox Game Pass games. That would definitely limit its reach greatly, but at the same time, I think it would still be an intriguing option. They've really been trying to sell these third-party controllers for phones here recently, but I think the next step is to just make your own handheld. I mean, if it's good quality, some people would be willing to buy it. I know I would rather just turn on a device that's meant for games rather than having to connect a controller and then take it off every time I'm finished playing. It also eats my battery and I, I just feel like I'd rather play on a dedicated game device rather than on my phone. 
That's just my opinion though, but I'd love to see what Xbox could do with their own handheld. Anyways though, that's it for this episode, but if you liked the video, don't forget the bell notification and subscribe button for more content just like this. Also, if you'd like to support the channel through Patreon, thank you for making this content possible. Peace out.